There's a big there's a big difference between how you learn European history in school with names and places and people and events and the vague archaeological record in North America. This begins to change it. Now we have names, we have nations, we have events, we have heroes. This is the beginning of this. Welcome, my name is Nathaniel Jensen. This is the Lost History of North America. I'm the research biologist with Answers in Genesis. I've been doing research on the pre-Columbian Americas and the history of peoples around the globe for the last several years. And I've got some spectacular new insights into the pre-Columbian world. If you've followed the research that I've been doing, what I'm about to show you has not been presented in public before, and I think it'll blow you away. I wanna make a special invitation to any Native Americans who are watching or First Nations in Canada or indigenous peoples, if you're even watching with subtitles in Latin America. What you're about to see, I think, will be an extremely valuable contribution to understanding the history of the world before the Americas. And I've got a special invitation for you at the end of this talk, especially if you're part of the uh, Algic language family groups, for example, the Cree or the Ojibwe or the Chippewa, or if you're part of the Sioux and Catawban language family groups, Lakotas, Dakotas and such, there's, there's a special thing I want to say to you at the end. So without further ado, let's launch into the lost history of North America. If you grew up like I did, you learned next to nothing about the pre-Columbian history of North America. What happened? Who was here? What were they doing? Where did they go? All these sorts of questions, basic questions that typical history classes answer for other regions of the globe have been left blank. I grew up knowing, knowing nothing about it. I knew who was here when Europeans arrived. But that was it. If you've spent any time trying to study the answers that have been offered to these questions, you've probably discovered that there's a major gap in our knowledge. And this gap is what prohibits us from being able to say more. You might say, what gap? I'm going to show you the gap. Once I show you the gap, I think you'll say, aha, now I know what you're talking about. I see. This is, this is the major hurdle we have to overcome if we want to solve this mystery. And to show you this gap, I want to start with something familiar. We're going to walk through the history of America beginning with European arrival as so many of us have been taught. We'll walk forward in time to get our bearings and then walk backwards in time. And As we try to walk backwards, then the gap will appear. For many of us, myself included, the history of North America begins with Columbus's arrival in what's now the Caribbean in 1492, his many voyages. Typically, my history, history classes, my own, would then jump forward to, if we're talking about the history of the United States, the first Thanksgiving, the Pilgrims, fast forward even more to 1776, the War for Independence of the 13 colonies. And at this point is typically when history books will cover who was here, beginning with tribes on the East Coast, because these were the peoples that the Europeans encountered as the colonies gain their independence. So you talk about the Massachusetts and the Narragansett and the Iroquois, the, 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 the alliance of the Confederacy, the Mohawk and the Seneca, the Powhatan and so on. And what's, I think, I, I can retrospectively now look back and say, aha, this is, this is what was so valuable, is we could put not only nation names down on paper, but we could put their locations on a map. And this begins to give us history. We could also put names to faces and talk about John Ridge, a Cherokee, and Sequoia. If you go further south, this is sort of the northeast, if you go to the southeast section of what's now the United States, you can talk about the Chickasaw and the Choctaw and the Cherokee in the creek and the Seminole and the, and the Trail of Tears. As you move further west, which is where U.S. history moves as the Louisiana Purchase happens and such, you can talk about the Plains Indians and their way of life and their culture and their lifestyles even further west, the southwest, the Navajo, the Hopi, and, and so on. So this is just to give us our bearings. Hopefully this is fairly familiar to you. It's familiar to me. What if we work backwards in time now and try to understand the answers that have been given before Europeans arrived? What do you find if you go looking, let's say, in textbooks and such? What you find is not names of people that go with pictures, you find academic terms with archaeological sites. Here is a mound in Moundsville, West Virginia, that will be labeled from the Edena era. Well, what does that mean? Who, who built it? What nations does this connect to? Closer to home for me, 
home right now is in northern Kentucky, near Ohio. The Serpent Mound is not too far from me. This is quite a significant structure. Well, who built that? Who does that connect to? Cahokia was the greatest city north of the Rio Grande before European arrival. And this is quite a massive mound that these people built. Well, who are these people? Why do we just have academic terms? This is an artist's rendition of what that great city may have looked like. If you look at the literature that's out there, you try to go before the Columbian era, you don't get very many clues. You get academic clues, but to say, oh, the Lakotas built this, the Choctaws built that, good luck trying to find answers in the academic literature. You get these sorts of terms, Mississippian, late woodland, and the dates I've given here are not the full boundaries of, of what's considered. I've just given representative years within those periods. So now what? There's, there's our gap. You've got archaeological sites with somewhat boring academic terms that don't connect for us to anything, it seems. In the pre-Columbian era, the post-contact era, you've got lots of familiar names and places and people and nations, but trying to connect this to that is the major problem. That's what's inhibiting our ability to understand what transpired in the pre-Columbian world. And today I want to tell you about our steps to bridge that gap. Now, before we get there though, the question of course arises, why is there this gap? Why can't we connect the Lakotas to this particular archaeological site, or the Delaware, the Lenni Lenape, to this particular archaeological site. Let me give you one example. The answer, in a sense, is because we know what happened in the early centuries, the early decades in the post-contact era, and what we know from that period is enough to say, wow, it's really tough to make connections. So let's use, again, just one example, talking about the Lakota Sioux, if you've heard of them as you study their history, you're probably thinking of them as a Plains Indian tribe in the what's now the modern Dakotas, North and South Dakota area. Have they always been there? I'll try to get my slide to advance here, sorry. Here we go. It would be a mistake to think they've always been there and we know that because in the post-contact era we know that the Santee Sioux push them out of Minnesota. So to back up a second, the Lakotas were not always in the Plains area. They came out of Minnesota because of pressure from the north. The Santee Sioux were in the Lake Superior area and they were pushed, pushed further south in Minnesota because the Ojibwe's north of them, north of Lake Superior, were pushing on them. So the Ojibwe's, sort of a domino sequence of events here, the Ojibwe's were pushing on the Santee Sioux, who then pushed on the Lakota Sioux, who pushed them out to the plains. So if there's that much movement since the 1600s, what can we say about archaeological sites? Where would you go looking for the archaeological record, the pre-Columbian archaeological record of the Lakota Sioux? And let me add one more element to this discussion that throws another wrench in our attempts to understand and connect post-Columbian history to pre-Columbian history. It's clues from language. So briefly, using perhaps a more familiar example, I'm speaking to you in English, and English is part of a larger language family, family just being a term for a grouping of languages that seem to have a common ancestor. And if that strikes you as odd, I can tell you that because I'm a German speaker, and have been in Germany multiple times and heard Dutch being spoken, heard Norwegian being spoken. These are other languages classified as the Germanic subgroup. English is as well. I can tell you that there's very clear and obvious similarities among some of these languages. If I listen very closely to Norwegian, to, to Dutch, I can almost understand it. It's still unintelligible to me, but I can almost understand it because there's, there's enough similarities there. Or to, to make another point, I play soccer with a, a group of Guatemalans on Sunday nights. I'm trying to learn Spanish. There's a lot of similarities between English and Spanish. There's a lot of similar words that make it straightforward for an English speaker to, to, to learn Spanish. They also speak Mayan languages. And I got a book on Mayan language vocabulary and such, and it is night and day from English. It makes learning Spanish seem like child's play. So just an example of how there's relationships 
among languages that we can recognize as coming from a common ancestor. Applied back now to the question of American history, I mentioned the Lakotas out here. This is, the, the, this is their grouping right here around the time of contact. I'll have better maps. Uh, we're working on these right now to show you in the future, but I'm using this one for now. The Dakotas are right here in the, in the Minnesota area. You'll notice that there's uh, other language languages being spoken out here near the East Coast. This is a map of the Suen Catawban language family. You can compare these languages, Lakota, Dakota, and so on, Catawban, to one another and quantify the amount of differences among them. And the most divergent different languages are the Catawbans over here. So given the likely possibility that all of these languages came from a common ancestor, Lakota as well, where would you put the original homelands for this group? If they came from a common ancestor, they came from a common population, where would that population have lived? The shortest distance between two points, between the most divergent and the less divergent, would put you around about right here. Part of the reason I put, you right here, put this circle right here near the Ohio River Valley is because the Osage themselves say, we came from this region. So not only have the Lakotas come from Minnesota originally, having been pushed out of Minnesota by the Dakotas and themselves having been pushed, out, pushed south by the Ojibwe's, it's not just that they arrived here late in history from the Minnesota, but they may have originally been further to the east and south down here. Again, just one example to illustrate that there's this major gap between the post-contact period and the pre-Columbian period. It's very difficult to connect one to the other. And this is a major reason why the history of the pre-Columbian Americas remains obscure. This is the first point I wanted to make. Set up the problem to solve, in a sense. Now, the whole reason I'm talking to you, of course, is because I'm going to show you that we've begun to close this gap. What I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is work that's already been accomplished before 2022, which is when I published my book, Traced, and, and talked about a lot of what I'm about to show you now. That's not the last point I'm going to make. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you how we've actually closed a gap in a spectacular way. So stay with me. Let me set up for you how, how far we've gotten before March of 2022 and what's happened in the last calendar year that's so spectacularly wonderful. The main, one of the main tools I've been using to interrogate history around the globe and also investigate history in the Americas among Native Americans before Columbus is a particular piece of DNA that is inherited only among males. The reasons I'm focusing on this are technical in nature. I won't cover them now for sake of time, but it just so happens to allow us to go way back in history, connect people groups back to sons of Noah, to be able to look at history in a generation by generation manner. It's, it's, it just has all sorts of aspects to its biology and inheritance that allow us to make some powerful inferences about human history. So the male inherited DNA is only a fraction of the total, only about 1% of a male's total DNA. It is passed on imperfectly from generation to generation. Mistakes are made. And these mistakes then act like a clock. So if you compare my DNA to my three boys' DNA, you're going to find differences between us, among us. If you compare my DNA to my dad's, you'll find differences. And on average, there's about three mistakes, three differences that occur every generation. So that you can compare mine to my son's, you'll find on average three differences. You compare my DNA, my Y chromosome, to my dad's, you'll find three differences. You compare my boys to my dad's, their grandfather, you should find about six differences. So you can compare any two men, count the number of differences, and this will give you a estimate, an estimate of how many generations ago they last shared a common ancestor. So if you're following what I'm saying, you can compare the Y chromosomes from men around the globe and reconstruct a family tree. This is the powerful tool then by which we can investigate human history and the history of North America before Columbus. There's lots of things you can infer. So this, this screen right here shows you an example, a representative example of the global human Y chromosome based family tree. This is from 600 men from around the globe from the Americas, you have Native Americans in this tree, you have Europeans, North Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, Middle Easterners, Central Asians, South Asians, East Asians, Pacific Islanders, and so on. Good representative example. 
these letters and these colors are given to highlight specific structures in the tree, sections in the tree. These labels come from the mainstream literature. There's a, there's a general rule of thumb. The deepest branches are given semi-arbitrary letters of the alphabet. That's why it goes from uh, F, G, H, I, J to T and then L and then O and then N and then S, K and M and, and so on. Semi-arbitrary. But you can see here that N and yellow here is, is fairly deep. Time, just to clarify, moves from top to bottom in the screen. So the present is near the tips of these branches. Ancient history goes back in time. This yellow branch has a very deep connection to the blue branches over here, O. Now let me go over to this part because this is where the business end of our discussion happens as it relates to the history of North America. You can see here there's Q in the pinkish color. It has a fairly deep connection to this section of the tree known as R. R further subdivides. So you've got in the lighter tan, R2. And then over here in lavender and dark tan, R1A. R1A further subdivides into, excuse me, and, and uh, this is R2, this is R1. Then lavender is R1A, dark tan is R1B, and on and on the, the naming convention goes. Letter number, letter number, letter number, letter number. That's just the method for the, the nomenclature rules for navigating this tree. You don't have to remember all that. That's just to explain what you're looking at right now. Now this family tree, I don't have time to justify all this, can give you information on changes in population size. It can detail for you migration events. And of course, especially relevant to our discussion, genealogical relationships. Again, I don't have time to, to, to explain or, or defend each of these claims. There's just a lot you can learn from a family tree. And just to stop and summarize, because we've covered a lot of ground, this is a family tree based on DNA, male inherited DNA, that DNA changes every generation. It acts in a sense like a clock. It can tell you genealogical relationships and the timing of those genealogical relationships allows you to reconstruct a family tree and there's lots that you can learn from a family tree. I want to draw your attention to this branch that I've already referred to, Q, because this is where you find the vast majority of Native Americans. Or let me stop for a second and say, if you look at Latin America, the vast majority of Latin American men do not have a native Y chromosome. They have either a European or an African Y chromosome heritage because of the history of European colonialism and the ugly history of the transatlantic slave trade. So if we exclude those from our discussion and just focus on native history, those that are not obviously European, not obviously African, the vast majority of what remains is this branch Q. And again, I'm going to summarize because this is something stuff I've covered elsewhere in a book and videos, and I'll point you towards those resources in a moment. The American side of this family tree, so, so what I've just done here is I've, I've isolated out this branch and I've rotated it 90 degrees, so now time moves from left to right instead of top to bottom. If you zoom in, you can probably read some of these names. Pima Indians, Mayans, Caritianas, and Suris from Brazil. Those are some of the, the populations that were sampled for this particular study. And you can see this whole section right here of Native Americans breaks away, separates from Mongolian. Pathran and Makrani are Pakistani groups. Russian, Naxi and Han are in, in China. Hazara in Afghanistan. These are Eurasian peoples. So the Eurasian section of Q separates from the American section of Q, which implies a migration event, around the 300s to 600s AD. That's when, to make a long story short, one of the populations in the Americas arrived, 300s to 600s AD. There's really interesting history here, why it happened, it correlates to the time of, of major movements in Central Asia, when the Huns came into Europe and overthrew the Roman Empire, when the Shanbai were overthrowing and, and, and infiltrating China at the fall of the Han Dynasty and so on, but this is all stuff I've covered elsewhere and, and don't have time to review. Instead, I want to draw your attention to another section of the tree in the Americas that will be especially important here in a few minutes once we bridge the gap. It's this other branch known as C. This is also found in Central Asia, among other places. You can find it in the Pacific as well. In past videos and in writing, I've talked about this branch arriving in the Americas a little bit later, around 1000 AD. That was a rough estimate based on the data that was available at that time. I can tell you now that we have more data that we can probably revise that and make it more precise to about the 900s AD. 
that's still several centuries after haplogroup Q. And if we back up a second, I can cover something I forgot to mention just a few minutes ago. The size of these circles represents the relative abundance. So you can see these circles right here are not quite as large as the circles for this branch. Haplogroup is just the term for branch, Q. So about 90% of Navajos, this, this circle right here, belong to haplogroup Q, whereas just a fraction of them, you can see it's a tiny circle right here, belong to this haplogroup or branch C. And again, this is, we, can, we can revise this now to the 900s. This is all information I've put in print in this book, Traced, came out in March of 2022, Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise, and I've talked about it in previous video series, which I'll, I'll point you to those links in a moment. So just to summarize then, I covered a lot of ground fairly quickly, again, because this has been covered elsewhere, and this sets up how we're going to begin to bridge this gap what this Y chromosome research implies is multiple settlings of the Americas. You'll notice I didn't talk about BC era branches. Who gave rise to the Mayans, to the Olmecs? That's because we don't have those branches yet. That's something we're still looking for. Again, we have the potential to identify movements, rises and falls in population sizes, migrations. So I talked about major migrations from one continent to another. If you're thinking about this and, and, and drawing this logic out, in theory, we should be able to identify movements within a continent, movements of the Lakotas from Minnesota, or perhaps from the Ohio River Valley, and, and so on. This has the potential to begin to close the gap between archaeology, pre-Columbian archaeology, and post-contact geography and nations. Now, at that time, March 2022, I did not have sufficient data to identify specific branches of the tree or sub-branches of the tree with specific nations. But that's, that's where we were. One other line of evidence that we were exploring and that I'd published on and, and talked about a year ago was the indigenous history of at least one of these nations, the Delaware. This map shows you the Algic language family, the Delaware nation, the Delaware language belongs to the Algic language family, and this map will become relevant, more relevant here in a moment. But for our purposes right now, where we were a year ago, was the following. The red record, or the Wallum Olam, was recognized as the Delaware nation's indigenous history for many years due to a thesis that was written about 1995 claiming that this record was a forgery, the Delaware Nation has now disowned it. I have showed in times past that there was a tremendous amount of history recorded in this record that matches exactly what we see in the Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA tree. Long story short, I find it difficult to believe that this so-called forgery could have anticipated genetic discoveries 150 years later. So to give you the backstory, this was recognized or, or collected, I should say, by Europeans in the early 1800s. It's since been claimed that this guy from Kentucky who collected the record actually forged it and made it up and wasn't actually the Delaware Nation's history. So this is early 1800s and I'm telling you, and I've said in, in, in print and in videos before, that this history and this record matches point for point the history that we see in the, in the Y chromosome, the male-inherited DNA-based family tree. So how could some guy in the early 1800s have invented out of whole cloth in, in, in indigenous history, in Indian history, that just so happened to match genetic discoveries a century and a half, two centuries later? I don't think that's just an accident. I think what the real story is, this is a real record from the Delaware Nation, from the Lenny Lenape, that tells their history. And just to summarize, again, because I've gone in more detail elsewhere, but just for our purposes, give you a brief taste of it. This record describes something that sounds like a creation event that, that matches Genesis 1. At the beginning, the sea was everywhere, covered the earth, sounds like Genesis 1, 2. The great spirit moved, and so on, bringing forth the sky, the earth. Sounds like a creation event. There's also a flood that I'm emitting here that they describe, it sounds like a global flood with some survivors. They seem to describe an ice age after the flood. Their home was icy, their home was snowy, talking about the Lenape in the old land, the winter land. They describe then 
after being in this icy land, what appears to be a crossing of probably the Bering Strait. By the Dark Fish Sea, the Gaping Hollow Sea settled the White Eagle Clan, the White Wolf Clan. They crossed. Aquaman, is, if you read on in the, in, the, in the text, seems to describe the Americas. They describe how many people crossed, 10,000, or 10 times 1,000 they crossed, so 10,000 people. They arrive, and this is where it gets very detailed. Once they arrive in North America, they describe a series of about 95, 96 sachems. Here they say White Eagle had been the pathmaker. Let me advance this slide here. The next sachem, and that, that's the main term that's used over and over again. The next sachem was history man, written records he began. Next sachem was shriveled man, next sachem was drought. This is the pattern you see going forward in the narrative. The name of the guy and one or two significant things that happened while he was sachem. So you'll notice early in the record, they, the red record itself claims that they began to write this history. Wise and crafty and counsel, just some more snippets. Uh, I, I wanna, I'm going to draw something out here. This, this will get us now closer to closing the gap between post-contact and pre-contact. It's not just the Lenny Lenape's history. It is their history that they wrote down, but it doesn't just talk about them alone. They talk about neighbors and enemies. He could fight every foe. The strong stone he struck down. Wholehearted was the sage in fighting the snakes. Now at first pass, this may just sound like figurative language. You look in context, it's clearly talking about specific types of peoples. Where this gets even more interesting is when you begin to look at the names and the origin of the names of some of these nations that we all take for granted. When I say the term Sioux, Many Caucasians will say, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Well, what does the word Sioux mean? The word Sioux means adder or snake in the Ojibwe language. Why would the Ojibwe's be giving them a name? Because they were neighbors. Remember what I just told you about the Lakotas. The Ojibwe's were pushing on the Dakotas, the Santee Sioux, who then pushed on the Lakotas and they went out to the plains. The Ojibwe's are right here. If we superimpose these two language maps in the grayish now color. You can see the Sioux and Catawban language family. Here's the Ojibwe's, their neighbors. Assiniboines, right here, means one who roasts using stones. There's a group of Siouan speakers called the Stonies. Hopefully this now begins to connect a few dots when this account talks about the strong stone, the snakes. This isn't figurative language. These are the names they've applied to their neighbors. So yes, this is the red record the Lenny Lenape's record of their history, but you're going to get some clues to other nations as you read it. This, this has much larger implications than just one nation. As you get further along in the narrative, they eventually reach the Atlantic Ocean, the Sun Salt Sea, they say. They talk about who was the sachem then. They talk about the arrival of the Whites twice. There's an initial sighting of them, for at this time, from the Dawn Sea, the Whites appeared. And then the Red Record ends with this sachem watching closely was the sachem looking seaward for at that time from north and south the white people came friendly people in great ships who are they and this is likely the dutch in 1620 and this is how the red record ends this has been speculated to be the arrival in 1524 of verrazano i think he was a, an italian conquistador long story short if you walk through all the details of the red record and again i don't have time to walk you through verse by verse what it says you can map out where the Lenni Lenape, the Delaware, came from, where they went, where they crossed the Mississippi River, where they eventually landed when the Dutch arrived and Europeans arrived in the 15, 1600s. 96 Sachems traces this migration path. Again, we can put a date right there. There's two other dates we can estimate. The fact that there's two dates leads to an ambiguity that I'm going to get to here in a moment. 1396 is a date that's been given for the arrival of the Lenape at the Atlantic Ocean based on wampum records. This is like a secondary tertiary source of it. Someone said they talked to so-and-so and then he communicated to so-and-so and that's how I found out about it. Written records from the colonial era. I'm actually suspicious this might be talking about the Ojibwe's. They might get the nations confused. But anyway, you have this date. And then you have the date of the first sighting of the whites, which I think is Verrazano 1524. Anyway, the point being, you have a date for the arrival of the Sun Salt Sea. You know the Sachem. You've got the closing of the Red Record, 1620. You've got these two dates, the number of years that have passed, plus you can count the number of sach sachems between these two dates. 
which gives you an estimate of the average sachem rule length. And you can extrapolate backwards in time and say, okay, when did they arrive in the Americas? You use the, the wampum base date, you get the 200s AD for the arrival. If you use the Verrazano, so again, so-and-so is the sachem from the dawn, see the whites first appeared, you put 1524 as a date then. You can, you can do the subtraction here to find how many years have transpired. You know how many sachems then from the red record exist between these two dates. Then you get an estimate for how, how long each sachem rules. Then you extrapolate backwards in time. That gives you a very different number, about the 900s AD. Now both of these numbers are compatible with the genetic history. But my point is, there's an ambiguity of several centuries. So if you try to assign dates to this interve intervening period, what do you do? If you want to, so these are going to be pre-Columbian dates. If you want to assign locations and dates to try to connect the red record to archaeology, you've got this several century ambiguity. And now you're stuck. Now, I said I've talked about this elsewhere. We did a 25-part video series in 2020. The New History of the Human Race, if you go to the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel. So YouTube channel, Answers in Genesis, find this playlist. Episode 13 goes into much more detail on this red record. I've also got technical papers on this. In 2020 I published the first announcement of an agreement between the red record and the genetic data. And of course I've gone into even more detail in this book, Traced Human DNA is Big Surprise. So let me stop and summarize. What, I, what I've told you so far is all attempts prior to today, prior to April of 2022, to bridge the gap between pre-Columbian archaeology and post-Columbian nations. I haven't yet, and we hadn't by March 2022, but we've made good progress in setting up a new framework. I had good genetic data to show all sorts of dynamic movement from Eurasia into the Americas, a very dynamic history in the pre-Columbian world, radically new information that no one had been talking about before. But I hadn't yet been able to identify specific branches of the Y chromosome family tree with specific nations. And on the indigenous history side of things, again, I haven't had time to justify this in this time with you, but I have talked about it again in those other videos and, and, and print resources, how this red record implies there have been multiple settlings of the Americas. The red record talks about there being people in the Americas before the Lenape arrived. It talks about their movements. You can map it out. But this chronological ambiguity, did they arrive in the 200s AD or the 900s AD? made it difficult to press the record for more detail beyond what we were able to infer. It made it difficult to close the gap. So that was the second point. We've begun, up to March 2022, we began to close the gap between the archaeological record and the post-Columbian history with these revolutionary discoveries, returning to the Delaware Nation, the history that was taken away from them. It was, it was told to them that this was a forgery. I think we have good evidence that it was not, but was actual indigenous history that was collected by a guy in Kentucky and has been transmitted to us fairly faithfully and just so happens to match very closely the history that we see in the Y chromosome record. So this sets us up now to where we were a year ago. This raises the questions. Can we press this data further? Can we dig further into the Y chromosome tree and the native histories to connect them to one another? and to the archaeological record. Can we close this gap? So what I'm going to show you now, what I'm going to claim, and you can watch and decide if I've justified this claim, what I'm going to claim now is that we've successfully begun to bridge one of the biggest gaps in the history of North America and in a revolutionary, in a spectacular way. This is the beginning of the lost history of North America. What transpired that then disappeared and that we're now beginning to recover. And here's how I'm going to do it. Right now, I haven't been able to connect Y chromosome branches to specific nations or to their indigenous histories, but I'm going to. And the way I'm going to do it is via an indirect route. I'm going to connect Y chromosome branches to a particular language family. So now I am going to be able to connect a specific sub-branch to a specific nation or group of nations related by language. And then we're going to connect a native history to that same language family. And so the Y chromosome history is going to, via this path, be able to inform and help anchor native history. 
And that anchored native history is going to blow open this question of archaeology. This is where I'm going. These are the steps I'm about to take. So let's now do it together. I said about a year ago, we had insufficient data to identify specific sub-branches of the Y chromosome family tree with specific tribes. Since that time, one of the biggest genetic testing companies in the world, Family Tree DNA, has released their Y chromosome DNA based family tree. And they say they have 214,000 tested users. So what this, what happens if you work with this company, if you take one of their tests is you pay the fee, you have the option of giving your background, your known paternal history, they send you a test kit, they take like a saliva sample or a cheek sample, you send back, they test it, and, and then they give you results. And, you, and I think you can agree or not agree to, to be part of their publicly available Y chromosome tree. The data has some limitations. Unlike some of the academic data, they don't tell you which nation in terms of Native American nation you come from or First Nation you come from. It's based on current political entities. So for North America, this database tells you, or you can report, yes, I'm from the United States, yes, I'm from Canada. So when I say North America, I'm, I'm referring heavily now to north of the Rio Grande because south of that, Mexico and such, is Mesoamerica, and, and that's a whole other topic for another day. North of the Rio Grande, North America, you can say I'm from Canada, I'm from the United States, or they also have the option of saying, I'm from the United States and I have Native American history, ancestry. Or you can say I'm from Canada and I have First Nation ancestry, paternal ancestry. So there's really four options. And what I want to focus on then is these two branches that we've already talked about, haplogroup or branch C, haplogroup or branch Q. We already know from the academic literature these are the major Native American branches. So we can specifically look at the family tree DNA database. We can look at the haplogroup C branch in that database. We can look at the Q branch in that database and count the number of individuals in the United States and in Canada, I should say United States Native Americans or Canadian First Nations or frankly any from these two countries in these branches because we know they're native and we know the specific sub-branches that are native. Fine. How is that helpful to our purposes? There's another set of data that's going to blow this wide open. We also have publicly available census data. So when the U.S. does a census, and I'm using the 2010 numbers, that's what I had access to, the U.S. asks questions about Native history. Are you Native? And are you only Native? So there's about four different categories you can answer. You can say, yes, I'm Native, and I'm only Native. Well, let me, let me break it down this way. You can say, I'm native and only native, or I'm native plus German, Italian, something like that. If you say you're only native, they're going to ask you, well, are you belonging to a single nation, or does your ancestry include multiple nations? If you say, I'm native plus, well, is your native side only native, or is it multiple nations, or one nation or multiple nations? That's how the data is broke down. The Canadian census data, which I have access to from 2016, doesn't break it down quite as detailed. You can say, are you from First Nation or not? And are you mixed or not? And in each of these data sets, what I looked at carefully was the category that was the most restrictive. So for the U.S. Census data, I said, let me focus on the numbers of those people who said, I'm Native and only one nation. I'm Navajo and only Navajo. I'm Cherokee and only Cherokee. This is how the numbers break down. And this is looking at percentages in terms of the total category in that column. So native, only native, only one nation. How do those numbers break down? And I've, I've broken it down by language family. Aak Athabascan, which would include Navajo, Apache, and such. Iroquoian, which would include Cherokee. Algic, which would include Chippewa, Delaware, and such. Muscogean, which would include the Choctaw, Chickasaw. Seminole and such, Sioux and Catawban, which we talked about earlier, Udo Aztecan, which includes some of the Pueblo peoples, the Hopis, and Eskimo Aleut. And you can see here, the, the bigger point I'm trying to communicate with this graph is that within the United States, there's a fairly diverse distribution of living 
Native Americans who say I'm native and only native and only one nation. It's distributed among several different language families. That's perhaps not a category in which you're used to thinking or that I'm used to thinking, but I'm reporting it this way because if you look at the Canadian data, it's not this well distributed at all. It is heavily skewed towards a single language family, the Algic language family, which would include Ojibwa, uh, Cree, and so on. The Eskimo Lut is the next category, Iroquoian and such, but you can see here 80% belong to Algic, whereas there's, there's nothing that comes anywhere close to that percentage in the United States data. So let me simplify this. I've been talk, talking about the Delaware or Lene Lenape red record, Walla Molum. They belong to the Algic language family. And if we break down these categories into Algic or some other group, this is how the US versus Canada data break down. In Canada, almost 80% are Algic language family. This is living natives. In the United States, the numbers are almost the reverse. Only 15% would say we were part of the Algic language family, and 85% of the US Native Americans belong to something else, some other group. Okay, I mentioned the family tree DNA data set. I'm now going to bring those results in and compare it to the census data, because I think we can use these data to connect a branch to a nation or group of nations. So what does the family tree DNA data set say about haplogroups or branches C and Q? How does it break down in terms of Canada versus the United States? Did you know that of those haplogroups C and Q individuals in the family tree DNA data set that are Canadian, 94% belong to haplogroup Q? That's a crazy amount of skewing, but it's intriguing because it seems to roughly correlate with the census data. The vast majority of Canadian First Nation individuals are Algic language family members. The vast majority genetically of Canadian natives are haplogroup C. This data alone would be strong evidence to say branch C represents the Algic language family. And this would be the first time I've been able to connect a specific branch with a specific nation or group of nations. But it gets better. What if we bring in the U.S. data? Once again, the data match quite intriguingly. Again, the Algic language family members in the United States, living natives, only 15% of the total. And appropriately, if haplogroup C is Algic, a small minority of the U.S. haplogroup C and Q individuals are in, in, in C. There's almost this, this mirror image as it should be. So together, these results are strong evidence, if you've not followed anything I've said so far, this is the main conclusion. First time I've been able to connect a sub-branch of the family tree to a specific nation or group of nations, haplogroup C is a very strong candidate for being the branch of the Algic language family. You want to know the Algic, you want to know Delaware history? Look at haplogroup C. Okay. How does this bridge the gap between pre-Columbian archaeology and post-Columbian nations? Well, it's, it's step one. I've been able to connect a specific branch to a specific language family. Haplogroup C to the Algic language family. Still work with me here, because now we're going to connect this to native history. I said the problem with connecting this native history, the Delaware nation's history, is this chronological ambiguity. There's a couple different dates late in the record, and if you extrapolate back in time, you get a several century difference. Well, one of those dates is the 900s. That's one of the possibilities. Again, this is, uh, the Delawares are part of this larger Algic language family. It goes without saying. So we've got a native history that belongs to the Algic language family, on one hand. I've got Y chromosome branches, a specific sub-branch, that I can connect to the Algic language family. That was this data right here. And if you'll think back a few minutes ago to what I told you, what we already knew, going back to March 2022, about haplogroup C, this arrives in the Americas about the 900s AD. So I think we have good scientific justification for using the chronology based on DNA, which we can connect to here, which connects to here. We can, we can use this chronology to help resolve the ambiguity in the native history. This data right here. 
So we can, instead of displaying it this way with, well, it could be the 200s, it could be the 900s, I think we have good scientific evidence to say the Delaware Red Record begins in the 900s AD, and now you can change these question marks to hard dates. We're still not yet at archaeology, but I said, if we can do this, now we can begin to connect native histories to the archaeological record. Can we? I've claimed that. Can we? I'm going to draw your attention to one specific set of events in this red record history. Around the Mississippi River, in the, what's now dated to the, to the mid to late 1200s AD, century or two before Columbus. Here's the relevant section of the Lenny Lenape's red record. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to focus on the details here because this is where it gets explosive. East, east looking was the sachem, melancholy about the war there was, I'm, I'm setting it up here for you, to the rising sun you now must go, he said, many were those who eastward went. So they're, they're, they're before the Mississippi, they're somewhere else west, and they're saying you've got to go east. They separated at the Mississippi, the lazy ones remained behind. So by the way, this red record itself talks about migration events. So you're thinking about the larger, not just the Sioux and neighbors, but the other members of the Algic language family, this red record is probably clues to this as well. When did the Cree originate, the part of the Algic language family? It's probably one of the separation events recorded in this document. So I can put a date now on that. Around 1243 AD is when they separated the Mississippi. I can put dates when there's a sachem. The lodge man was the sachem. The Talega possessed the east. We can put a date on that, 1251, roughly. Strong ally was the sachem. Land to the east he asked for. 1258 for that. Eastward some traveled. The Talega king massacred them. Now, I've just read two names that might be unfamiliar to you. The Talegas, who are they? The red record doesn't necessarily tell us, but it gives us some clues. It says they possessed the east. So just to stop and summarize for a moment before we go to the archaeological record. What the red record says, this anchored narrative, puts them at the Mississippi by about 80, 1250, and in confrontation with the Talegas, whoever they are, whoever they are, they're possessing the East, so they're a powerful group of people. Now, you might recall from the beginning of this time together that I mentioned from the archaeological record the city of Cahokia, the greatest city north of the Rio Grande before the arrival of Europeans. And I say that because I'll just quote the textbook for you now, this ancient North America by Brian Fagan. Fagan was a professor at UC Santa Barbara, archaeological record of North America. He says, Cahokia flourished with what was probably the highest population density north of Mexico. So that's his statement. Interesting. Cahokia is now modern St. Louis. So the Anchor Delaware narrative puts them at the Mississippi by 80, 1250. Not necessarily St. Louis, but it's a powerful enemy ruling the East. And if you're looking at the archaeological record for candidates of powerful enemies ruling the East, Cahokia kind of comes to mind. Is that, a, is that a fair equivalence to say the Delawares are confronting the rulers of Cahokia? Well, read on what the archaeological record says. Again, quoting from this book, textbook. Sedentary villages prospered at or near Cahokia after, after 8600. Not a, big, not a big town, not a big city at that point. Then apparently within a few decades, around AD 1050, a great center emerged at Cahokia itself. The height of its power was between 1050 and 1250. Cahokia's power declined after AD 1250 when other large centers rose to prominence. Moundville by the Black Warrior River in west central Alabama flourished between AD 1250 and circa 1500. Moundville, here's an image of it in Alabama, you can see it's not nearly as imposing or as large as some of the mounds in Cahokia. And just so that we're all on the same page in terms of geography, what this archaeological record implies is that Cahokia was this great city until about 1250, and then it declines. But around the same time that it declines, other sets of mound-building cultures arise to the south, southeast. So I said the Red Record talks about the Delawares arriving in the Mississippi confronting some powerful enemy ruling the east. I paused that and said if we look at the archaeological record, we've got this massive city on the Mississippi who just so happens to decline after 1250. And following that decline, there's new mounds to the south, as if perhaps whoever was ruling Cahokia 
left and restarted in the south. Now let's unpause the red record, go back to that and see what else it says about the interactions between the Delawares and these Telegas, whoever they were, who possessed the east. United, enraged, they all declared, to battle, destroy them. The Iroquois, their northern friends, then arrived to join them. The Iroquois are joining the Delawares to help them in battle. Sharp one was the Sachem, the pathmaker across the river. So apparently they cross the Mississippi. 1266, I can assign a date now. They won many victories there, driving away the Telegas. Still 1266. Stirring was the Sachem, extremely strong were the Telegas. So they hadn't wiped them out yet. That's 1273. Breaking open was the Sachem, capturing all the great towns. So roughly 1280. The Crusher was the Sachem, southward flood all the Telegas, 1288. Interesting isn't it? So, the Red Record puts the Delawares at the Mississippi about 1250, then they cross it and they have a series of battles with the Telegas, eventually conquering them and sending them to the south. The archaeological record says Cahokia is this great city north of the Rio Grande, probably the best candidate if you were looking for one, for someone ruling the east. They just so happened archaeologically to decline right about the time that apparently the Delawares arrived. And archaeologically, there's new mounds to the south, which is what the Delaware record says is the direction that they sent the rulers of whoever the Telegas were. So the red record is almost an exact match to what the archaeological record says, now that we have the red record anchored to a firm chronology. So this journey recorded in the Red Record is quite impressive. And what I've just told you isn't the entire story. We know the names of the men who led this greatest conquest in the pre-Columbian North American era. If you're Anglo, Caucasian like I am, you may have missed them the first time because you're not used to thinking of names of this way. But let me remind you that you probably subconsciously already are. When I talked about the movements of the Sioux, of the Lakotas in the 1600s from Minnesota, I showed this image, and this is an image of, a picture of Red Cloud, one of their greatest chieftains. Maybe you don't know his name, but you probably know the names of other great Sioux chiefs, like Big Bull sits down. You say, what? Well, I don't know that name. Sitting Bull, you might know that name. That's the shortened version of Big Bull sits down. One of my favorite names, though, perhaps, of the Sioux and Chiefs would be Young Man Afraid of His Horses. Now, there's some debate if it's actually Young Man Afraid of His Horses, as if he was afraid of his horses, or it's Young Man Whose Horse is to be Feared. Regardless, hopefully what you see here, and perhaps what you're even reminded of, was the creative and functional way, I might say, that native nations would adopt names for themselves, or be given names by their parents. That same pattern holds true within the Red Record. Who, what, what are the names of these leaders who conquered Cahokia, the greatest conquerors in North America, it seems, in the pre-Columbian era? Sharp One was the Sachem, the pathmaker across the river. They won many victories there. Stirring was the Sachem, extremely strong were the Telegas. Breaking Open was the Sachem, capturing the Great Towns. The Crusher, aptly named, was the Sachem, southward fled all the Telegas. Finished them off, it seems. These men, are the great heroes, the conquerors of the pre-Columbian North American era. We can now recover this lost history, begin to recover this lost history, and restore the pre-Columbian era back to its rightful place and, and uncover this history similar to how we understand European history. There's a, big, there's a big difference between how you learn European history in school with names and places and people and events and the vague archaeological record in North America. This begins to change it. Now we have names, we have nations, we have events, we have heroes. This is the beginning of this. Conquerors. And, and let me add to this, it's not just that we have names of these people and events with dates. Think about the Algic language grouping as a whole. They have, if you look at the, the groups in North America, Algic speakers, Sioux and Catawban speakers, Aak Athabascan speakers, the Algic language family has more languages than any of them. One more than even, even the Athabascans, which includes the Navajos and the Apaches. This is based on data I was looking at in February of this year, 2023. 
more languages than the Sun Catawbans. 48 here, 19 among the Sun Catawbans. Look how much land the Algic language family groups eventually conquered at the time of contact. So the Delawares and their relatives in the Algic language family are some of the greatest conquerors in the pre-Columbian North Americas, conquering the greatest city north of the Rio Grande, and also one of the most geographically and linguistically successful pre-Columbian communities. And I should add, though it perhaps goes without saying, one of the most meticulous pre-Columbian communities of historians. If they hadn't written down what they did and where they went and what transpired, I wouldn't be able to tell you this story. This raises the question, of course, how much more history is waiting to be uncovered? How much more lost history is out there for the taking, for the relearning? There's huge untapped potential in the field of genetics. So I've been able to align one branch, sub-branch of the tree, with one particular group. How many more other branches are waiting to be connected to other nations and groups? The second huge untapped potential, from what I can tell, is other native accounts. Now I've, since March of 22, gone further south and looked at Central America and South America, and there's, there's incredibly detailed histories there from the natives that align with this Y chromosome history that's, that's, that's going to be exploded, that the mainstream community, just like they did for the Delaware, said, ah, we can't trust it, it's mythological, it's fake, it's whatever. But that genetics says, no, it's real. And you're all insulting the native communities by rejecting them as real. Since March of 2022, we formed a Native American study group. I already have, uh, as members of this group, we've got uh, Cree and Yupik and Navajo and Cherokee, and we're hoping to expand it. And this is where I want to make, a, make a, uh, a special appeal to anyone who's part of the Algic language family or the Sioux and Catawban language family. In part, hopefully you've seen, because we already have a really great start connecting a branch to the Algic language family to the Red Record. And the Red Record talks about, most likely, other sub-branches of the Algic community when the, Chip, uh, when, the, uh, when the Chippewas likely broke off, or the Cree, or the Arapaho, and, and so on, Cheyenne. That history is likely there, and in y'all's communities, there may be even more history that's untapped that can further expand this account and re-reveal to us what transpired in the pre-Columbian world. I mentioned the Sioux and Catawbans because when the Red Record talks about their enemies, their neighbors, and others, it's probably talking about some of the Sioux and Catawbans. I mentioned the Udo-Aztecans, the Shoshone. They are geographically up near the likely path of the Delaware migration. There's just so much more history, but any nation in North America, and really if you're watching this and you're in Latin America, we're wanting to expand into this as well. There's a tremendous untapped potential. If you'd like to join us, join this already existing Native American community. And one of, the, one of the things we're hoping to do is begin with perhaps 100 males. So just to clarify here, and I thought I had a slide for this, but I guess I, I failed to have it. Uh, oh, here. What would be most helpful from the genetics perspective is Native males, First Nation males, who have a known Native ancestry. That's not because we have specific preferences or want to discriminate. It's simply, if we want to understand the Native history, we need to find the Native Y chromosomes. So if you're a male and you say, yep, all I know is as far back as I can tell, it's been, it's been Native father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on, you'd be a tremendous candidate for this. I mentioned any Native American community, but there's special interest here in, in, in these in particular, but again, any of these communities would be fantastic. There's so much history left to be uncovered. Now that we've finally been able to close one of the gaps between pre-Columbian archaeology and post-Columbian history, how much more can we connect? So, if you want to get in touch with me, you go to our homepage. So, just to clarify then, I work for Answers in Genesis. I'm the research biologist. We don't get government money. This is not a, this is not a government project. We're a Christian organization. Our primary goal is to defend the history in Scripture. It just so happens that if you start with the Scripture's history, all these historical events pop out from DNA, and they restore to natives the history that 
the mainstream community has rejected and treated as forgeries, as mythological, as, as whatever. So this excites me. I'm not native, but I'm excited to be able to hopefully give back to peoples the history that's been taken away from them. And I would love to work with you to, to do this. Ultimately, the goal is that every community around the globe, native or non-native, is it, it takes ownership of this research, runs with it, and is able to uncover their own history and, in a sense, give the world a gift of this history, recover the lost history, and then for the entire community, be able to reveal it and advance all of our knowledge. Ancestorsandgenesis.org is our homepage. If you go to that homepage, type in slash go, G-O, slash traced, traced is the name of the book. It'll pull up a page that looks like this. There should be a button at the top of the page, history, Hidden History of Every People Project, which you can click on or you just scroll down to the bottom of the page and you'll find a place to enter name, email, phone number if you want to, a uh, message. This goes directly to my inbox. This is how we formed the beginnings of this Native American study group already. So the Navajo and Yupik and Cree and, and Cherokee have connected, contacted with me that way. Uh, and we spoke by phone and by virtually I've been able to meet with at least one in person. Again, we're hoping to grow this group, maybe eventually have about 100 Native male volunteers, which again, if you're not strictly male history, you're a lady, you're welcome as well. We have men and women as part of the group. The genetic is just one aspect of this. The Native history is another huge aspect of this, trying to recover as many Native accounts as we can, because so many of them have been rejected or just dismissed. Come join the group. I think there's a tremendous amount of exciting things left to be discovered, much more lost history to be recovered. This is the book I've referred to repeatedly where we began to set this new framework for Native American history where I talk about how the red record aligns with the genetics. We've done, this is now another video series that we began in March of 2022 called Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise. Again, go to the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, look for a playlist by that name. There's, uh, I think, like the third or fourth video in this series talks about the, the new Y chromosome discoveries and how it lines up with Native history. This is the older 2020 series that goes into much more detail about the Red Record, episode 13. Other books that you might be interested in, if this is a topic that piques your interest, Replacing Darwin talks about the larger creation evolution issue, which in a sense is unavoidable. Once you start challenging the mainstream narrative, it raises a thousand questions, and this seeks to answer them. This is uh, a very strong defense from genetics of the biblical view of the origin of species and of course the human species, our own species, is one subset of this larger question. This is sort of the Cliff Notes version of that same book in a one hour video summary you can find here or if you go to our streaming service answers.tv you can find that as well along with thousands of other videos. We are the organization with the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter in here in northern Kentucky so come visit us and especially if you're native and you come visit we'd love to meet you in person. If you want to contact me a different way, I do have accounts set up on multiple social media channels in addition to Facebook and Twitter. So you can, you can do the answersingenesis.org slash go slash trace to go directly to my email or you can contact me this way as well. I've talked to all sorts of folks that way. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been the Lost History of North America, spectacular new insights into the pre-Columbian world. And my hope is this is just the beginning of the closure of the gap between pre-Columbian archaeological records post-contact history, one discovery of many more to come. Please join us again. I hope to get in touch with you, with many more of you. Thanks again for joining us.